okay, wrestling fans, it's the Parental Guardians of the Galaxy. The Stepdads! And you can follow us on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and Patreon at Stepdads Wrestling. As well as ProWrestlingTees.com slash Stepdads. And more. Oh, it's about the time we had the talk. Stop. I mean, and you're watching Wrestling with Regret. Well, the poll I put in two weeks ago was a lot closer than I expected it to be, but at the end of the day, by less than 10 points, your winner and the show that I'm reviewing this time around is WrestleMania 23, taking place on April 1st, 2007, 13 years ago to the day this video is coming out from Ford Field in Detroit, Michigan. WrestleMania back in the Detroit area for the first time in 20 years. Of course, that was WrestleMania 3 in Pontiac, Michigan, Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant, the main event that changed everything for the company and for wrestling going forward. A lot of references and allusions to that show are made in this event, which we'll get to as this review goes along. Lots of people on Patreon nominating this show, and I'll name them now. Here we go. Warren Mapp, Jeffrey Pridemore, Robert Stoll, Ship 55, Joey Williamson, Autumn Breeze, and Caleb Robinson all nominated this show over on Patreon.com slash Wrestling With Regret. 80,103 people in attendance at Ford Field the fourth largest crowd in Mania history, a $5.38 million gate, and a buy rate of $1.2 million, which made it at the time the most bought Mania of all time. The theme, uh, I don't talk about theme songs for shows that often, but I wanted to talk about this one, just have a funny anecdote for it. Uh, the theme was Ladies and Gentlemen by Saliva, which at this point they were really kind of supplanting Limp Bizkit as the company's favorite band, like they would eventually do Batista's theme as well. And there are, all, there are a lot of the albums they have coming out too. Like they, they did a a version of like a Jericho theme. They did the theme for WrestleMania. They did Batista. They're everywhere here. Anyway, uh, uh, this song always makes me smile because at the time, 2007, I was wrestling for this company and the top baby face of the company came out to this song. And it was at the same time as Mania 23 was happening. And I thought that was really, that's kind of cheap and pandering to come out to that theme. It's like, it just makes you, all it does is remind fans of the bigger event, WrestleMania 23. And so I thought that was kind of tacky. But then again, I guess I can't talk about it because in my very first match the previous year, due to an audio error by the sound guy, I played the wrong track on my CD, I came out to Big Time by Peter Gabriel because that was on my mix disc. So it didn't come out to the song I wanted to, but that was also like that year's WrestleMania theme. So I guess I really can't say shit. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm making his debut here this afternoon. ECW is given a lot of love on this show. Of course, the previous year they were revived as a third brand, so they're really making a big deal about the fact that, you know, uh, for the first time in WrestleMania history, these officially designated ECW stars are a part of WrestleMania. Kind of cool to see that name and the legends of ECW and the championship on display at this event. And it's crazy to think how that was considered revolutionary 13 years ago. They would not believe the shit that's happening in 2020. And let's talk about the theme for one second. The all grown up the atrocious tagline that is all grown up. Like I get it because you know it's 20 years removed from WrestleMania 3. They're coming back to Detroit. They're grown up as a company. A lot's changed. I get that, but I just I never liked and watching it again, I still didn't like the campaign they had going through the entire show with these kid versions of the wrestlers, like kid versions of Austin and Batista and Lashley and Cena and Michaels and the Divas collectively, because there's not one woman on the show that can like outshine and be their own thing. They have to be lumped in with every other woman. It was just such a weird visual. I don't want to envision these big badass fighters as little kids. Like, how does that, what does that accomplish? That doesn't make it any more relatable. It just makes it weird. And my favorite part of this though is when they do the Austin one and the kid like has the milk cartons and just bam, right in his eyes. It's nothing in the mouth. That shit's hilarious. Also, I find it interesting how they open the show because, you know, in hindsight, we all know this is like the Donald Trump WrestleMania. It's the one where Trump, McMahon, Battle of the Billionaires. That's the big selling point for this show. And in the marketing for this show and the run up to this, a lot of the focus was on McMahon, 
Trump and all the mainstream press. That's what they got as well from WWE was that particular match. But if you watch the opening hype package, which I think does a very good, it's a very good litmus test of like what the company is putting priorities on for that particular uh, mania. There's no mention of Trump or McMahon in that opening hype package. It's all about all grown up. It's the kid wrestlers. It's the big, it's the big grandiosity of WrestleMania. But Trump has nowhere, nothing, nothing to do with that. Battle of Billionaires is not mentioned at all in the opening package, which was a huge shock to me. Uh, looking back at it and just kind of we all collectively think oh yeah this is obviously it's the battle of the billionaires show and that is still the biggest part of this whole show but yeah it's really weird it wouldn't be featured at all in that high package i love how they open up this show it begins with this old footage of uh, wrestlemania 3 vincent man opening it up and introducing aretha franklin to sing america the beautiful and they do a cross dissolve and there's aretha franklin 20 years later singing america the beautiful at ford field really cool to use the the, the past and present footage there and here's your announced team for the show jr and the King for Raw, Michael Cole, and JBL on SmackDown. I'm really excited for this because early JBL commentary before he officially like transitioned out of wrestling, fully retired, and went into commentary, that was like peak JBL on commentary where he was like full on, still an asshole heel, still very audacious, and he's so good for a lot of the, the, the moments you hear him on this show. And meanwhile on ECW, it's Joey Styles and Taz. Your opening matchup is the Money in the Bank ladder match. Jeff Hardy, King Booker, Finn Finley, CM Punk, Mr. Kennedy Kennedy, Matt Hardy, Hey Nothing You Can Say, Randy Orton, and Edge. Man, Orton and Edge have a long and winding road through the years, haven't they? Uh, just crazy that we're about to have that match again. And here they are as competitors in Money in the Bank. Team Rated RKO was still a team at this point, but they were having their, their signs of stress and tension, so they'd be on their way out and be split up in a couple of months after this, but they're still technically a team here. Uh, all six men of the commentary team are taking part in this matchup. So you'll hear all six guys just yelling and trying to talk over each other here as this goes on because all three brands are represented. Somebody please shoot me. Finley begins with a big dive onto everyone on the outside. Booker pulls out a tiny step ladder, and that's some big foreshadowing there. CM Punk bleeding for some reason. The Hardy Boys set up some kind of ladder structure in the ring, but it backfires when Edge suplexes Matt through it. Ugh. Kennedy goes for the Kenton, but Matt rolls out of the way. Kennedy hits the back of his head on the ladder. A lot of just ugly looking moments with the ladder here. They don't look entirely safe. Everyone gets a good run though. Booker, Finley, Edge, CM Punk grabs the ladder to the old Terry Funk spot. Jeff Hardy has the opportunity to win, but instead he decides to just climb the giant ladder, drop ass first onto Edge, who's laying on a ladder bridge on the outside like a dummy. Both men are just removed from the match entirely. They're too beat up to go on. Edge has gone to say that was not a very fun bump to take, and I, I wouldn't disagree with him on that. But in their defense, that is an insane spot. One of the craziest in Mania history history and it will certainly live on in perpetuity so even though from a psychology standpoint it makes no sense as to why they do it in the match at least it's going to just live on forever and damn that jeff hardy damn him to hell orton with a string of rkos he and punk fight their way up to the top of the ladders and we get an rko from there then booker with a bookend to orton off the ladders matt and booker are climbing queen charmel gets involved matt holds her hostage and forces booker to jump down saver and jbl tremendous here booker to hell with her i've left plenty of Matt takes a snug, flat back bump of a falling ladder. That looks totally scary and painful. Finley bleeding off the top of his head from somewhere. He gives a Celtic cross to Matt on the ladder. Poor Matt. Who did he piss off to take such stiff bumps tonight? Finley's all alone in the ring, but he's too beaten up to climb. In comes Hornswoggle from under the ring. Volunteers to climb for Finley. It's crazy to think it'd be uh, less than a year from now we finally get the blow off that they're father and son. But here comes Kennedy. He grabs Hornswoggle, drops him with a plunge off the ladder. Hidden gem on commentary here when they say Hornswoggle was too short to grab the briefcase. Taz goes, that's why I never fought in the ladder match, Cole. A nice little self-deprecation by Taz there. Punk and Kennedy fighting atop the ladder. Ken is knocked off, but he hits Punk in the mush with another ladder, climbs, and grabs the briefcase to win. I give the match three and a half stars. The extra half star is on the merit of JBL's commentary alone for this one. This match feels like kind of like a middle of the road money in the bank to me. I felt they weren't too creative in their usage of the ladders, but the whole thing looks snug as hell and sometimes not in a good way. Obviously the biggest highlight is the Jeff Hardy edge moment with the big dive up the ladder. But again, from like a psychology standpoint of trying to win the match, why would you do that? Because Jeff Hardy had the match won. So he looks especially dumb for removing himself 
and Edge from the equation. But yeah, it was still, you know, had its exciting moments, got the fans riled up and everything, so at least it accomplished that in spades, for sure. Backstage, Kennedy congratulates himself for winning the match. He brings up a line he would later use in TNA, or at least a version of it, where he goes, you know, nice guys finish last, so thank God I'm not a nice guy, and thank God I'm Mr. Kennedy. Oh, he's so close to dropping the uh, thank God I'm an asshole line. He's not quite there like he would be in TNA, but man, this was it. For Kennedy, if you were a Kennedy fan, then you were on cloud nine with this moment here of him winning the briefcase because he debuted the previous year and he got this just big, this surge of momentum, got super over, and even I got swept up in it too at the time, just watching him and just like being enamored with his self introductions and everything. And uh, yeah, this was kind of like the climax of that. They, oh man, this is, they're going to strap the rocket to him and it's going to be great, right? But not so much because several weeks later, Kennedy would get injured and they weren't sure at the time if it was going to be like a short term injury or long-term injury, but they wanted to cover their bases, so they had Edge beat Kennedy on SmackDown to win the briefcase, so Edge becomes a two-time Money in the Bank winner in that respect, and so they write Kennedy off, and this, oh, turns out he actually has the shorter injury, so in hindsight, we didn't really need to take the briefcase off him, but by then, the damage was already done, and he never really got anywhere close to that kind of rarefied air ever again in the company. The closest it would get to was then when they teased him to be Vincent Mann's illegitimate son later in the year after Vince got blown up in the limo, but that never materialized because he was suspended as being part of a uh, alleged steroid ring along with a lot of other wrestlers, so that was gone, and so these bad moves, bad timing, bad injuries, uh, that plagued Kennedy a lot in his uh, later years in the company, and then of course he didn't ingratiate himself with a lot of people. His last moment moment on, in, in, on television for the company, he had just come back from an injury, he drops Randy Orton with the, with the back suplex, a little too high on his neck, Orton complains, and Kennedy gets fired. So that's it for Kennedy. All this like wasted potential of uh, this star in the making of Kennedy. And then it just it kept kind of spiraling from there. Like he would be a world champion in TNA and be a pivotal part of the Aces and Eights storyline, but you just get the feeling from looking at Kennedy and especially the trajectory he was on in WWE. Like man, probably one of the biggest what ifs of the last like decade and a half in my opinion. Up next, the great Kali versus Kane in an interpromotional matchup of Giants. Now, fun fact, when I fired up this show on the network to get ready to watch the show to review, it opens up at the end of this match. This is the last thing I watched on this show. Why, you ask? Well, it turns out it has to do with the fact that I ranked this match as one of the worst WrestleMania matches of all time. And so the last time I watched this show was for this match for research. And so, yeah, not looking forward to how this one's going to play out. So we have this match up here, and I'm actually looking at my notes just below the lens, and I see I wrote a typo. I actually spelled it the great khaki a couple of times, so I'm just going to roll with it. The great khaki is much stronger than Kane expected. He no-sells and manhandles the big red machine, just beats him down for several minutes. Jim Ross on commentary describes it as bowling shoe ugly offense, which is the nicest way you can put saying this match ain't that good. Khaki no sells the big diving clothesline that Kane's known for, but he does fall back and gets tied up into the ropes. Kane grabs his see no evil chain and brings it into the ring and Khaki goes bop just before brain chopping Kane. <laughs> Chekhov's chain is used to give Khaki a low blow and a body slam, which the crowd absolutely blows up for, and rightfully so. It's always impressive to see a guy that big get body slammed. It's one of the few actual bumps great Khaki takes in his entire career in WWE. And of course, again, the comparisons of 20 years ago, Hogan slamming Andre. This is the modern equivalent, Kane slamming the great Khaki. Khaki recovers. It's a double-handed choke slam, and the disrespect, pinning Kane with his foot on the chest to win the match. And wow, talk about a declarative statement. A big, dominant win by Great Khaki uh, against a guy who, ironically, was the big, dominant win guy in his prime, in his heyday. So crazy to see how it kind of comes full circle for Kane on this one. Then afterward, Khaki uses the Jacob Goodnight chain to choke Kane out, and that's pretty much it. I give it a half star out of five. Bowling shoe ugly indeed. Now, the big body slam was very impressive. And that was the biggest spot of the match. But it was just a one-sided squash, and I think Kane honestly deserves better. I think for what Kane brings the table to have him be the one to be sacrificed the great khaki like this and just be no sold time and time again that i think was just absolutely insane it does make khaki look very strong and it does help uh, give him a nice decisive win as he goes into a title feud with john cena in a couple of months from now leading into summer but yeah that match it definitely i stand by my opinion one of the worst mania matches 
of all time. Backstage, Crime Time try to console Eugene who had his head shaved last week by Mr. McMahon. Crime Time want to cheer him up, so here's the extreme expose. And Eugene's not too keen on those ladies, but he does like what he sees with the fabulous Moolah and Mae Young doing the same kind of thing. And in comes the conveyor belt of the wacky legend cameos. You have Reverend Slick, Dusty Rhodes, Sergeant Slaughter, Jimmy Hart, IRS, Gerald Briscoe doing a war dance, Pat Patterson in the background, Ricky Steamboat doing the karate thing and a wink and a nod to the fans, Gene Okerlund, and we all wrap it up with Dam Simmons himself. Well, isn't that just a fine, wacky, how do you do? This skit was one of the many that we saw during this time period. Like every WrestleMania, there's always the legend carousel doing the funny stuff, ending with the Dam by Ron Simmons. And I, I very vividly remember the one before this one, WrestleMania 22, where King Booker and Queen Charmel walk through the hallway and they're encountered by all the weird characters in WWE history and stuff. And so this is just one extension of that, and it just kept going on for a very long time. So in the history of wacky legend WrestleMania segments, this was certainly one of them. U.S. title on the line as Chris Benoit defends against MVP, or as the network describes it, MVP challenges for the United States Championship. This is MVP's first WrestleMania. He came onto the scene the previous year in a pretty big way. He was debuted, or he was heralded as this big, just recently signed free agent, very much so in the same vein of like a uh, very entitled uh, sp pro sports star. Football, basketball, he's got like the, the ringside seat, the custom suits, the bling and everything, very much in that vein and very much unlike any other wrestler being presented at the time, uh, before or since I think, really much that kind of like pro sports vein. Uh, I, I vividly remember his first major loss came in an Inferno match to Kane uh, shortly after his in-ring debut, which that was kind of weird. I didn't know what the point of that was. What about MVP's gimmick screams, put me in in a fire gimmick match with Kane and then lose. I thought that was also kind of surprising as well. But I mean, you know, everyone has to lose eventually. And so that was an interesting way to go about it. And then, of course, he was on an uh, on upward trajectory ever since coming back from the Inferno match, leading up to this feud here with Chris Benoit. I also dug Benoit's tights in this matchup, the comic book themed gear. Very nice touch. MVP able to keep pace with Benoit early on, counters upon counters. I love this moment where MVP throws Benoit in the corner before going to do the move. He charges up going. Ah! MVP. MVP works over Benoit's shoulder, but Benoit is able to hit his triple Germans. Big superplex by MVP, but Benoit catches the legs, gets a two count. MVP back on top, goes balling, but he does miss the corner Yakuza kick. Benoit hits some more Germans, the diving headbutt, the win, and he retains the championship. I was really taken aback about how well this match holds up 13 years later. I think MVP looks like a total stud in this thing. Benoit does a really good job making him look good here, and MVP has said in interviews since that he credits Benoit. The run he had with Benoit here is what really directly improved his in-ring work during this time of the company, and it shows here. Uh, it also was nice to have this matchup as kind of a palate cleanser after just kind of like the stuff that we saw in the previous like 15, 20 minutes. Benoit and MVP would keep going on though with their feud. I was actually surprised in this match ending because I'm like, huh, I thought MVP won this match and won the championship. That was where my memory went, but apparently it was two months later at Judgment Day when MVP beat Benoit two straight falls and a two out of three falls match to win the championship. Donald Trump is backstage with former Miss America Tara Connor. She won the previous year, so here she is sitting pretty and doing nothing else. The boogeyman is coming to get them. Tara runs off, but Trump is unfazed and completely no sells boogie, tells him to get him a sandwich, and the boogeyman obliges. And I'm coming to get you! <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm going to bet nobody slapped Donald Trump after the camera stopped rolling, much like Jim Cornette did to Santina Morella when the same situation presented itself in OVW. Now, Boogie has gone on the record to say that Donald Trump was the person he least enjoyed working with, directly because Trump felt that apparently he didn't need to sell the Boogeyman's gimmick. I guess he thought he was above that. But why? Why does he feel the need to not sell the Boogeyman's gimmick? I, I hate when that happens, when especially outsiders break the fourth wall and like diminish a character's defining trait. Now, the Boogeyman was like a baby face. He was like a wacky, scary baby face, but people still feared him, as you saw with Tara Connor running off and everything. Uh, even John Cena like put on a face when he saw Boogeyman for the first time in a backstage segment. So even he gives the Boogeyman a bit of credit, and Donald Trump, not so. So that I thought was interesting. There's not too many people in the world of WWE who've ever graced the, the programming who gets to do that. They present the 2007 Hall of Fame class, the Wild Samoans, the original Sheik, 
Nick Bockwinkle, Mr. Fuji, Jim Ross, Jerry Lawler, Mr. Perfect, and Dusty Rhodes. Damn good class. World title match is up next as Batista defends against The Undertaker. Now, back at Survivor Series 2006, Batista won back the championship. He never truly lost. Of course, earlier that year, he relinquished it due to injury, came back, had a big, long, multi-month feud with King Booker, leading up to him getting the championship back at Survivor Series. He's been on a roll ever since. Meanwhile, The Undertaker finally winning his first Royal Rumble match. It took him long enough, but he finally gets that accomplishment under his belt. He chooses Batista as his opponent. A very fierce, intense rivalry builds over time, and it really hits the boiling point at No Way Out when there's a dream match between Batista and Taker and Shawn Michaels and John Cena in tag team action. Batista turns on Taker in that match to give Cena and Michaels the win, but it will not be the last time we see those four guys in action. Let's talk about intros for a second. Batista is ultimately nothing special, but it wasn't until his intro where I finally paid attention and realized, oh my god, how massive is this set here for Mania 23? It was the largest set in Mania history at the time, though I feel that other sets since then have been larger. I could be wrong, though. The Undertaker, he's got druids, and now that is an iconic shot. That silhouette, the light beaming behind him, the big hat, the robe. Holy shit, that is the fucking Undertaker right there. The match opens right away with a spear. Crowd very anti-Batista here. Batista hucks Taker into the stairs. What a flip off the knees there. JBL on commentary can't stop talking about how bright the lights are. Batista with a very rare dive off the top rope and Cole freaks out. I've never seen Batista! I swear to God, I've never seen Batista! And there's the cover! Come off the top rope! We get some yay boos. Taker gets a good run, complete with a big-ass dive to the outside. Batista hurls Taker into the timekeeper's area. And this is before it became its own little walled-off area with collapsible barricades, perfect for those OMG moments. Batista hits Taker with a running power slam from one announced table to the other. Oh my God. Taker somehow able to stay in the fight. Some great back and forth, and the crowd is very much into it here. Batista with some corner punches. Bad move, Batista, because here comes Taker with the last ride. Yes, that is a SmackDown display at reference. Thank you for noticing. Batista hits the Batista bomb and Taker kicks out. After a little back and forth sequence though, Undertaker with the tombstone to win. 15-0 at WrestleMania. He becomes the world champion 10 years after beating Sid at WrestleMania 13 to win the World Wrestling Federation title. I give it four and a half stars out of five. This was one of the best matches on the night. I love the intensity. I love the physicality and the storytelling. I think Taker at this point in his career is at the perfect intersection of like, he's got enough miles in the tank to keep showing up on a regular basis, but also he can he has like the working shoes on, and all of his matches are these top tier matches now, and he's really hitting his stride, and he's really hitting his prime, and so it works so well with Batista here, who, you know, only a year before this, really needed a lot of guiding to have these passable matches, but now he's really come into his own, and he's just really showcasing here, they both have a great work here, and like I said, it is one of the better matches of the night, I think you can make the argument this match should have gone on last, uh, other than what did go on last, but when we get to that match, then we can compare the two. Backstage, Mr. McMahon checks himself out in the mirror when Stephanie walks in with one of the grandkids, supposedly. Holy shit, let's stop for a second and look at those Trump pictures on the wall. I forgot there was a segment on Raw in which Vince does his thing. Well, let's use the Photoshop gimmick these kids are using and make Donald Trump a wooly willy. Those are still popular, right, pal? Yeah, there's a picture of Donald Trump with Rasta hair. I'm not sure how that works. How would you have more hair than before after you get it shaved bald? Anyway, Vince, and there's so much going on with this segment here. There's the crazy-ass Trump pictures, which are just used for this segment here. And then the real cherry on top is when Vince uh, yells like a demon at his uh, at the invisible grandchild here. Like, what the hell are you doing bringing my kid here? Like, wow, why would you talk like that to a baby? And then we get baby POV cam. We get uh, the point of view, the perspective of the baby looking up at Vincent Mann, baby talking in graphic detail about what he wants to do to Donald Trump in the ring tonight. And then you can't have a segment this near and dear to Vincent man without having it end in one of his classic all-time favorite gags a shit joke where he goes this baby just did a trump like oh man this was just complete insanity from beginning to end and again this reminds me a lot of a very similar segment pre-match thing the previous mania when vince fought Shawn michaels and he had the big prayer circle with his family he's super tanned and jack going hallelujah like that's the same kind of vibe i got from this one here too 
It's a battle between the old style of ECW and the new, as the ECW originals, Sandman, Rob Van Dam, Sabu, and Tommy Dreamer take on the new breed. That's Matt Stryker, Elijah Burke, Kevin Thorne, and Marcus Corvon, formerly known as Monty Brown. Real short uh, run in the company Monty Brown had here. He was there for a bit in ECW, and then shortly after this, he had to leave the company, leave wrestling altogether for family reasons. But man, one thing they could never take away from him was that dope theme song he had. Sabu and Sandman working fast against Matt Stryker early on. Crowd's really dead for this one. The last match really took him out of it. Corvon working over Tommy Dreamer. Everyone takes turns with Dreamer in this match until he outsmarts Burke, hits a DDT Nightbreaker combo onto Elijah and Marcus. Hot tag to Rob Van Dam, the team captain. He's throwing those baked potatoes. Corvon stops RVD on the outside, which leads to a plancha by Sabu. Kind of scary fall there. Dreamer with a DDT on Stryker. Sandman takes Burke out of the ring. Five-star frog splash onto Stryker. And the originals win and kind of a feel-good moment there. I give it one star out of five. You know, I compare it to the eight-man tag team match I reviewed the last review I did for Mania 27. This match was better in a lot of ways than that other tag team match with the core and everything, but that's not saying much because that was also a pretty bad match. This one was also short in its own way, longer than the other eight man I reviewed, but this one was still relatively short considering everything else on the card. And it was just like everyone was in place to get their shit in and not even not all of it looked that good. Sabu, surprisingly like horrendous botch free, but he was not perfect on this one. I think, yeah, and Sandman also had some scary looking moments as well. Yeah, nice moment for ECW. Like I said, really cool full circle to see ECW finally get revived and get their moment in the sun in WrestleMania. Even if it's a bastardized version, it's still cool to see ECW get some love here at WrestleMania. We get a promo advertising WrestleMania 24 in Orlando for the following year. Not the logo they ended up using, though. Then we go to the Battle of the Billionaires, the match you've all been waiting for. You've got Bobby Lashley, the ECW champion, who is the proxy for Donald Trump, taking on Umaga, the Intercontinental champion, who is the proxy for Mr. McMahon. It's one of the most memorable angles in recent company history, concocted by two very good friends in the business world. Of course, before becoming president, Donald Trump was a real estate mogul who did a very good job promoting his personal brand for decades and the relationship with he and Vince goes decades back. Uh, he His name was on the venue for WrestleManias 4 and 5. He'd appeared as a guest at WrestleManias since then. Like I said, he and Vince are tight and you could say this angle and I don't want this to be misconstrued or taken in a snarky way. I mean this as seriously as possible. This angle between Vince and Donald is essentially a love letter to each other. So how did it all go down? As I mentioned in last week's countdown, in January of that year, Vincent Mann hosted a match between imposter Trump and Rosie O'Donnell. It was so bad it prompted the fans to chant TNA at it. Trump got upset and responded a few weeks later on Raw by telling Vince he was going to give the fans what they really wanted, money. A veritable stimulus package falls from the sky. Vince doesn't care for that, so it finally comes down to the battle of the billionaires being made official in February. They pick their proxies. Vince chooses Umaga, who comes out with his manager, Armando Alejandro Est. Strada, really underrated manager. And then, of course, Trump picks Bobby Lashley, who's the ECW champion. And, of course, this is the beginning of that now classic phrase. Do we love Bobby? Do we love Bobby? Of course, at this time, Lashley is very blatantly being groomed as the next big star in the company. They strapped the rocket to him. He won the Extreme Elimination Chamber match in December uh, to win the ECW title. He's been on a tear ever since then. He is the first ECW champion to compete at WrestleMania, though not for the championship, but he is in this ridiculously high-profile match, so it's definitely like a big stamp of approval for Lashley. But apparently, and this is something I forgot about until I did my research for this week, this was not planned to be the original matchup, because it was supposed to be, you know, obviously uh, the the callbacks to WrestleMania 3. Apparently the original plan was going to be Hulk Hogan fighting for Donald Trump, and given their history and the promo that Hogan cut for Trump at WrestleMania 4, I, that makes sense to me, versus The Big Show representing Vince McMahon. And that would have been a great matchup. We've seen it before, obviously, in years past, but with the added prestige of WrestleMania and the callback to Mania 3, makes all the sense in the world. But then Big Show went on a hiatus for several months out of the company, so the great Khali was being penciled in to be the giant for Hogan 
going to wrestle. But then Hogan and Vince probably had a falling out over money. And so, uh, yeah, we never got that Hogan matchup. We never got the, uh, the, the resurgence, the revival of Hogan at WrestleMania 23. So we get these guys instead. Some great moments of building this angle, including a high profile contract signing between Vince and Donald, uh, Vince shaving Eugene's hair to get heat on the go home show of Raw, Lashley hurling himself through the steel cage wall to get to Umaga on an episode of ECW. This angle definitely got the attention and the push it deserved given the players involved, but I have to admit, as a viewer at the time, I really couldn't have cared less about this storyline. I know it's going to ruffle some feathers when I say that, but it's for a lot of different reasons. Like, I didn't care that Vincent Mann was going to be put in another high profile angle at WrestleMania. Again, I was kind of sick of that. I didn't care about Donald Trump either way. He was just kind of there for me. I didn't have a connection with him or I wasn't a fan of his. So I was like, oh, okay. He's just divine. Donald Trump, great. He and his friend are going to have a match at WrestleMania. And like, of course, the foregone conclusion, of course Vince is going to lose. Of course he's going to get his head shaved the hands of his friend Donald Trump because he wants to help his friend out. He wants to get the mainstream exposure and he's a businessman. So it makes total sense. So there's that issue. Also, I don't really care about the players involved. Uh, you know, even if they were the first choices, I don't think I cared about Bobby Lash at the time. I, I thought he was pretty vanilla. I thought he was pretty bland. And so I couldn't get behind him. And also to an extent, I felt the bloom fall off the uh, rose with Umaga a lot as well. And again, it's just like, ah, it's like there are these matches and there are these champions, their belts aren't on the line and they're in this foregone conclusion match. So it's like, yeah, like why, why do I care? The association between like Umaga and Vince and Lashley and Trump were very tenuous at best. And like I said, they weren't the first choices and it really shows because Hogan and Big Show would have made a lot more sense. Uh, and I think that would have added a lot more star power, would have made a lot more memorable in a lot of ways, but I was just totally, totally uninvested in this matchup. So at least now 13 years later, I can look back at it with fresh eyes and just we'll see how this match uh, plays out. Oh, and by the way, Stone Cold Steve Austin's the guest referee for the match because that's pretty much all they can do with him every year at WrestleMania. The barber's chairs on a rolling platform comes up to some ragtime music. Brilliant. Trump looks just thrilled to be there, doesn't he? And he's got Tara Connor with him again. You won't be seeing her ever again after this though. Lawler with a funny line though during the entrances. Oh, Trump was the most searched name on the World Wide Web last week. Yeah, I love the emphasis on World Wide Web. That was still, I guess, a thing back in 2007. A lot of ham hocks getting thrown around between Lashley and Umaga at the start. Lashley has a shoulder block, but Estrada gets Umaga's foot in the ropes. Lashley brings in Estrada and crushes him. The crowd's just totally quiet for it. Lashley pulls a top rope down on Umaga, who does a completely unassisted rolling front bump from the ring to the floor. Holy shit, that's not a fun looking bump. Lashley then goes for a spear, but Umaga dodges. Lashley takes his own big ass tumble out of the ring. Austin gets in the face of both Lashley and Umaga throughout for not respecting the law, son. Umaga works over Lashley with some big old slams. Lashley does not have the strength to fight back. Vince gets on the apron for no reason, so of course he gets knocked off by the wrestlers. Lashley makes a comeback, we get a double down. Austin stops the count at nine because he wants to see a winner and a loser. Out comes Shane McMahon, future best in the world, coming out of checking this old man. Austin physically pulls Umaga off Lashley. Shane on the apron to distract. Then Umaga takes out Austin with the Samoan spike. Shane and Umaga attack Lashley at the same time. Shane even hits the coast to coast. And Trump, who's right fucking there next to Shane, does nothing about it. Shane reveals a referee shirt. Oh, hell, it's 1998 and 1999 all over again. Big splash. Shane goes to the count, but Austin pulls Shane out of the ring and beats him up. Trump seems very uninterested. What's going on over here? Trump finally tackles Vince in a moment that will be used as a meme to this day. Austin hits the stunner on Umaga. Wham! Spear by Lashley. The bell rings after two, but Austin makes a three anyway, and Lashley wins. I give the match two and a half stars out of five here. It's a case of the spectacle of the match and all the hoopla surrounding it being greater than the action in the ring itself, which, to be honest, is not that impressive. And I do think it got a little overbooked, and like I think it's so excessive when they do these prolonged heel beatdowns with everyone and their mother getting involved. When Shane got involved, they're like, man, I used know what's going to happen here. Lash is going to find a valiant way to come back and win. Even if the ending is predictable, make the journey fun. Make the journey interesting. And to me, it wasn't that interesting. For the reasons I said, I was just, you know, I w uh, as a viewer at the time in 2007, I didn't care about the build. And in 2020, watching it now, uh, I just didn't care about the match itself. I just don't think it was that good. And again, the spectacle, great. And as far as business went, boffo work. But I just think that, you know, this match itself wasn't that special. But again, that's not the important thing. The match 
was immaterial because all it was was, you know, Vince getting his head shaved. Speaking of which, after the match, it's time for the long walk to haircut town. Austin grabs Vince and Vince lets out a terrific yell. Wait a minute. Ah! Oh my God. Vince is cornered, but Shane can't leave well enough alone. He gets beat up by Austin for his efforts, complete with a ridiculous bump out of the ring after a stunner. Vince tries to sneakily sneak away and gives a look like, I'm on the ramp, so I guess I win. Bye, pal. But Lashley grabs Vince, brings him into the ring, into the chair. They strap him in and they get a cutting. Laura with a great, kind of a subtle callback when he talks about the chair, saying, you know, my, my dentist has straps on his chair like that, but not my barber. Nice little low-key reference to Isaac Yankum there. Anyway, the shaving happens. Vince is screaming. It's a great visual. We suddenly hear Bald-Headed Blues, a song that is clearly recorded by Michael Hayes playing over the loudspeakers. Bald-Headed Blues! Bald -headed blues. Oh no, wait a minute. Then Lashley shows Vince his own reflection in the mirror and he's seen a ghost. Vince walks off completely traumatized. Trump takes one of the worst stunners of all time and that's the segment. Jerry Lawler says that if Vince wants to run his fingers through his hair, he'll have to cut a hole in his pants pocket. Amazing. Trump would more or less evaporate from the company after WrestleMania for a couple of years, but the feud with Vince and Lashley would carry on well into the year because the following month of Backlash, a do-rag wearing Vince would beat Lashley to become the new ECW champion, beating him in a handicap match alongside Shane McMahon and Umaga. Then by the summer, Lashley would finally win it back, then drop it right away after being drafted to Raw, and Vince would blow up in a limo. In your semi-main event, in a match that was almost cut for time given how long the head shaving segment had just gone, it's a Lumberjill match for the Women's Championship as Melina defends against Ashley Massaro. Ashley was the 2005 Diva Search winner who famously got a leg up on the competition that year by giving away her phone number to everyone watching on live TV. And so in 2007, she is the latest WWE lady to be the cover star of Playboy magazine. And all that attention makes Melina super jelly. And that's what leads to this match happening here. Here. Melina immediately powders, which seems like a mistake. She gets beaten up for a quick second by the Lumberjills. Roll up attempt by Ashley and a kick out. Melina with the advantage. Giant swing by Melina. Eat your heart out, Cesaro. Creative arm and back submission on Ashley here, but Massaro comes back with a head scissors, fights her way through a monkey flip, goes for an elbow drop that I think would have missed anyway, but Melina rolls out of the way. O'Connor roll by Ashley, but Melina rolls through and pins to win clean. Ashley is a sore loser and fights Melina, which leads to all the ladies getting in the ring for a big old diva fight. Lumberjill pandemonium, says JBL. The post-match fight gets the biggest reaction of the segment. I give it a half star out of five. This was clearly the match with the least amount of care and planning going into it, given the fact it was the most expendable match. They were ready to cut it at a moment's notice because of how long the Battle of the Billionaires went. Molina tried her best here, but Ashley, sadly, was pretty rough in the ring. It's just crazy. I keep bringing this up when I look at older WrestleManias from as recently as a decade ago, but man, it just keeps, it bears repeating just how far women wrestling has come in WWE for them to have a match like for the championship that almost gets cut for time and then you would never imagine that today but in a weird way the women's wrestling still has a long way to go in that company because you've got like these situations with all these ladies with nothing to do so what do you do with them you make them lumber jills in a match that goes maybe three minutes and you've got you know the women's battle royal for all the women who are being unused right now not any kind of particular storylines so it's still a long way to go for the ladies but a lot of progress has been made in some respects so I guess we can be thankful of that. In your main event, John Cena defends the WWE Championship against Shawn Michaels. Now, like I mentioned, the whole SmackDown side of things is taken care of after Taker won the Royal Rumble and challenged Batista. So what happens on the Raw side? Well, the night after the Rumble, Michaels and Cena beat Rated RKO to become unlikely new tag team champions. The following week, Michaels beats Edge and Orton in a triple threat to become the number one contender to Cena's title. And the story from here on becomes, when will Shawn turn his back on Cena. Look at the track record that Sean's had his entire career, turning his back and stabbing his friends in the back. So Sean's not to be trusted. But Sean very emphatically states that, you know, I've got John Cena's back until WrestleMania, and then all bets are off. But he does a bit of a fib there, because in the go-home show before WrestleMania, they have a rematch of the No Way Out match, him and Cena versus Batista and Taker. That's when Michaels finally turns on Cena and allows the SmackDown guys to get their win back from No Way Out. Anyway, the match begins with the intros. Sean comes
coming out to the DX theme with this one because DX had been revived, uh, but it was on the shelf temporarily after Triple H tore his quad in a match at New Year's Revolution back in January. And ooh, who's driving that sleek Ford Mustang through the streets of Detroit and into Ford Field and through that piece of official WrestleMania 23 glass? It's John Cena. Frankly, I was not impressed by this intro here. Not one of the best WrestleMania entrances of all time. The match begins with a feeling out process. Michaels is able to avoid Cena's earlier attacks, talk some trash, give it an advantage though. Cena finally hits his first big clothesline of the match and the crowd lets him have it. Play on the mind of Cena, lead the oh! Cena missed twice, oh! but not the third time. The action spills to the outside. Michaels with a springboard acai moonsault of Cena onto the announce table. That does not always pay off, so glad to see it happen here. Michaels attacks Cena's leg and starts tearing at it. At one point, Michaels gets in Cena's face and starts talking to him more, but the audio, at least on the network feed, cuts out and we can't make out what was being said. Does anyone know anything about what's happening here, why the audio sounds so muffled? Cena gets worked over until he dodges a Shawn attack into the corner, HBK busting himself open on the ring post, because you can't have a Shawn Michaels WrestleMania match anymore without a little bit of the color. Also, the referee's taken out with Sweet Chin music, so he'll be out for a while. Sean hits a beautiful spike pile driver onto Cena on the steel steps. Cena now bleeding from the back of his head. A new referee comes in, but there's only a two count. HBK with the elbow drop goes for Sweet Chin music, but Cena snuffs it out right quick. After much tussling, Cena hits the FU and a kick out. A super FU attempt is blocked, but Cena catches the cross body, goes for another FU. Sean lands on his feet. Sweet Chin music attempt. Cena goes for the ST TFU, Michaels rolls him up and a kick out. Love that sequence. The STFU is locked in, but Michaels barely grabs the ropes. Cena gets testy with the referee, walks right into Sweet Chin Music, a long crawl into a cover and a kick out. These two guys are absolutely spent, but Cena strikes first. The STFU locked in yet again. Michaels taps. Cena wins. He is the first and only man to win three straight Mania world title matches. I give it four and a half stars out of five. This was a damn near perfect match. I thought these two told an incredible story. I just love the action here in the ring. The one nitpick I have about this match was though I felt they really abandoned the story of, Sha of John's leg being attacked. I don't think I saw Sean put him in one leg hold after the initial early beatdown of Cena's leg, which to his credit Cena did a very good job selling. But besides that little detail, I mean, what a match. And just again, comparing this match to the world title one with Batista and Taker earlier on, you could make a case for either of these matches to go on last. I think each of them deserve it, and I think that based on what you see in these matches, either one of them could have been a satisfying end to WrestleMania. The only reason I would put Batista and Taker on last is because of the significance of the Royal Rumble, Taker winning the Rumble match, and challenging Batista. That's the only reason I would have put that above Cena Michaels, in my opinion. Also, I would have had the fans go home happier than they did with Cena winning, because people still don't really like Cena at that time. After the match, Cena wants to show Sean some respect and talk it out, but Michaels wants none of it. The next night on Raw, Cena and Michaels would lose their tag team championships in a battle royal. I saw the Hardy Boys win that one and become tag champions yet again. And so then the feud between Cena and Michaels would continue on to the next month, a fatal four-way with those guys, Edge and Randy Orton. Cena would, of course, win that match and go on to fight the great Kali. Everyone in this, in this match here would go their separate ways after Backlash. As far as what happens the rest of the year, hard to say because Vincent Mann blows up in a limo and kayfabe and Chris Benoit does what he does in real life. And so for me, a lot of the details, all the minutia of 07 is kind of a blur. My final grade for WrestleMania 23 is a C plus. Much like the last Mania I reviewed, this show was wildly inconsistent in terms of match quality. It was like good match, bad match, good. They could, God forbid you have two good matches in a row on this show because you don't want to make the momentum too nice, I guess. And I will say though, I think that, you know, the Battle of the Billionaires, I didn't put it as a pro or a con because frankly, it did nothing for me. I, I'm sure some people in the comments section are going to say, oh, you're anti-Trump, da, da, da. Nothing to do with what's going on in our current timeline. I'm saying as a wrestler, fan back then and watching it now is just like don't do anything for me. Obviously, the significance of Battle of the Billionaires is very large to the company. I am not going to argue that. Did great numbers for this WrestleMania. So, the credit goes where credit is due. And Vincent Mann, the genius that he is, he knew people would drop down serious money to see him get his head shaved on live pay-per-view. So, that makes him a pretty smart businessman in the grand scheme of things. But, as a match and a spectacle, did nothing for me. Sorry.
Well, I hope you enjoyed my review of WrestleMania 23. If you want to play a role in determining which shows I look at, be they good, bad, or somewhere in between, go to patreon.com slash wrestlingwithregret, become a $10 backer or above, and you'll have a chance to nominate classic shows for me to review. Now, like I mentioned uh, two weeks ago, the big poll, it was Mania 23 or New Blood Rising. And I know New Blood Rising didn't win, but a lot of people still voted on it. I will get to that very soon. Before we're done with Mania season, I just got one more Mania. I want to get off my chest before we move on to New Blood Rising, and that's going to be WrestleMania 6. Going way back for this one, folks. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.